Welcome. Hello, thanks for being here. It's really good to see all of you again. Welcome ILA students and professors, first year mentors, and other non-ILA related guests. Thanks for being here today. So when we last met in this space, it was uh, several weeks ago, and we were here to listen to David Timmerman speak to the question, what is a liberal arts education? And students, I wonder if after that convocation and the readings and the discussions that followed for that week, if you weren't worried that all we were going to talk about in ILA is what is a liberal arts education. No doubt you were relieved and hopefully very pleased as we moved into other topics and other texts, such as the Glass Castle. Um, we do care uh, very much that you become good thinkers, better thinkers. And we do believe very much that a liberal arts educational approach is an excellent way to do that. But we care about other things too. And that's why this course has not only a title, uh, ILA, but also a theme, Self, Stranger, and Community. So today's convocation, as well as the next two, so there will be one in mid-October and one in mid-November, these convocations all relate to that theme. So before we get started today, I do want to give you just a couple of reminders. I'm sure you figured out by now that you will be held accountable for what you hear today. You're going to write something or have a discussion or maybe even a quiz. So listen well, take notes, and put away your phones so that they do not distract you or other people. So yeah, put those away. And um, we will have a question and answer session at the end. So during the talk, you can prepare for that. I encourage you to take notes during the Q&A. Sometimes there's really good uh, information that comes out there. And um, then don't put your stuff away until I come back up here for a final announcement. So at this time, I'd like to invite to the stage Professor Dan Ott, who will introduce our speaker. Good morning. It's uh, really a privilege to be invited to, uh, to uh, introduce to you my friend and colleague, Dr. Hannah Schell. Uh, Dr. Schell rece received her uh, bachelor's degree from uh, Oberlin College, uh, where she studied philosophy. If uh, you haven't heard of Ober Oberlin College uh, before, it's one of our nation's uh, finest liberal arts and fine arts institutions. Uh, she received her PhD from Princeton University, uh, where she studied religious thought and wrote her dissertation on the, uh, the American philosopher Josiah Royce. Um, she is the co-author of this uh, fine book with <laughs> yours truly. Uh, it's called Christian Thought in America, A Brief History. Uh, it uh, makes for great holiday gifts. Uh, <laughs> Put it on your coffee table, sparks great conversation, bathroom reading. It's available at all your favorite uh, <laughs> local and online booksellers. Uh, she has also uh, written a chapter in uh, this book published with Oxford Press called At This Time and In This Place. Uh, her chapter is pertinent to what she'll be talking about today, and it is titled Commitment and Community the virtue of loyalty and vocational discernment. Uh, but perhaps uh, most importantly, if one has the eyes to see, uh, one can see Hannah Schell's fingerprints all around uh, this college. Uh, she was one of the original architects of the Integrated Studies Program, uh, the four course program of which uh, Introduction to the Liberal Arts is the first course. Uh, she directed uh, the Reflections course set in that program and the whole program for several years. And she was also um, one of the catalysts for our conversations here on this campus about vocation, about finding meaning and purpose in your professional, personal, and educational careers. Um, but perhaps uh, most importantly, uh, Hannah is well known among students and alumni as being uh, an extraordinarily caring teacher, mentor, and friend. So again, it's my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Hannah Schell.
Can you hear me through this thing? I think you can. People in the back, okay. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's really great to be back here in Monmouth. I've been away for over a year, and uh, you may know as new uh, members of this community, I think you probably had to sing the uh, alma mater song at your matriculation, and there's this line um, about uh, a thousand hearts devotion to the school we love so well. And I remember for the first few years that I was at Monmouth, I would roll my eyes <laughs> when we'd have to sing that song and stand up. But let me tell you, this place, once you're here for a while, uh, gets a hold of you and has an effect. So it's, it's really nice to be back to a school I love very much. Um, so this is what I want to talk about today. I uh, believe that it is going to tap into a lot of what you've been reading and talking about uh, in your individual sections. Um, we're going to make the PDF of this presentation available you know, today, so you don't need to frantically write down all of the quotes. You do need to take notes, so you've got to figure out how to do this balance of sort of listening, thinking, and writing at the same time, good skill. Um, I'm going to be putting forward a lot of uh, claims. Some of them you may raise your eyebrows and disagree with me, uh, and I'm really hoping to prompt some good conversation. I'm going to raise more questions than I am going to offer you answers. Um, But I appreciate this opportunity to uh, share with you some things that I've been thinking about for a really, really long time. Um, In fact, on my bibliography at the end, I think the second book on the list is actually a book that I had to read in, we used to call it freshman seminar, back in the mid 80s, a book called Habits of the Heart. And um, now retrospectively, right, because this is how we figure these things out, is looking backwards, I can see that that book uh, really changed my life. It was my first introduction to a sociological approach to religion, to a critical Uh, approach to American culture. It was raising some really serious questions about individualism and how uh, religious uh, practice uh, was changing in this country. And I can now sort of connect the dots uh, to uh, some things that I continue to think about. So thank you for this chance to share with you some of that. Um, Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. We're going to start with identity. This sort of follows the rock path here. Um, So I'm going to say a little bit about identity, then talk about narrative, which is mostly picking up on some of what's in the essay you read by McAdams and Guo about uh, some different vocabularies, and then move into uh, a discussion of purpose. And where I'm headed with this is I want to suggest, you could think of this as a slightly different vocabulary, a way of thinking, uh, and I'm calling it lives of creative commitment. So, let's start with identity. All right, the question of identity is, who am I? I want you to spend 30 seconds and jot down the first few things that come to mind if you were to try and finish this sentence. I am. Lots of ways you can finish it. Don't overthink it. Just jot some notes down. Nobody's going to see this except for you. If you're wrestling with a book like The Glass Castle, you can also do this as a thought experiment with the characters. Um, We're going to move through this quickly just in the interest of time, but here's my hunch of some of the things that you might have put down. If I were to sort of do this, this is the kinds of things that I think might come out. And so I just want you to notice all the different ways that you can begin to answer that question, who am I? Some of you may have put down things that um, sometimes academics call social location. How many people sort of put down their gender as a way to answer I am? Okay, 
Um, you might put down an ethnic identity. You might put down socioeconomic class, maybe. It uh, might be a part of how you understand yourself. Um, this could also include sort of geography, where you're from. So I remember in teaching ILA when students would introduce themselves, uh, where they were from seemed to be very important to their identity initially. So, you know, coming from a small town near Monmouth or coming from the south side of Chicago, coming from out of state uh, can play a part in your identity. And in fact, I was sort of remembering recently that um, during my first couple of years here at Monmouth, Professor Vivian, you'll remember our friend Cindy Coe, uh, she was the chair of philosophy and religion. I guess she was sort of my boss. And uh, in her own quiet, wise way one day, she said, Hannah, you know, it's really important to you that you're from California. I grew up in California. And I was like, no, why, why do you say that? And she's like, because you mention it all the time. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And to tell you the truth, I think it's because I was going through a little bit of culture shock. Like, how did I wind up in this small town in uh, Monmouth, Illinois? And so something that had not been an important part of my identity was sort of flaring up and suddenly, uh, I guess, coming out in how I was talking. How many people sort of answered that question with what, what I'm going to call like personality characteristics, sort of descriptions of like, I'm outgoing or I'm shy? Yeah, I think that's a lot of how we come to understand our identity. And it's worth thinking about how you come to see yourself that way. Uh, sometimes it's that it's just, you know, you've been on the planet long enough and you encounter other people and so you see, oh, um, in fact, Cindy Coe made me see that I'm very much an extrovert, but at the end of the day, I am totally revved up. She was an introvert and really was the first kind of introvert, I'd say, that I had ever worked with, so she was sort of depleted and needed to go home and rest to be ready for the next day. Sometimes we learn these characteristics about ourselves through our encounters with other people, and sometimes very explicitly it's because other people, uh, hopefully they are sort of well-meaning, actually say to you, you know what? you were really good in that presentation. You should think about doing something that involves kind of public speaking, and maybe you never thought about it. I want you to stay attuned to those sorts of things, because usually people are being honest with you, and also don't miss chances to reflect back to other people their strengths, because this is all part of the process of your identity. Experiences can certainly come to mark who you are. Um, I think this is absolutely the case with Jeanette Walls, right? And so part of what I think you're going to be wrestling with is how has um, her adver adversity really played a part in who she is? And that's part of what she's trying to share with you in her memoir. Gifts and talents, values? How many people sort of wrote something along the lines of, I am someone who is vehemently opposed to the death penalty, or I am, I'm a Republican? Did anybody kind of write down something you'd say is like a political or maybe a religious value or a part of your identity? Not so many. That maybe comes more with time, becomes part of your identity. Um, that may be something that happens more while you're in college. How many people wrote something about a role like, I'm a daughter or I'm a son, I'm a girlfriend, I'm a boyfriend, I'm a brother? Great. Uh, we're going to talk about Confucius here in a second, and those sorts of things are very important part of our identity. Maybe less obvious, um, but part of what I hope to sort of begin to instill in you is to begin to connect your identity to your sense of where you hope your life might be going. And so this is sort of future-oriented and maybe even aspirational, but I remember a student in ILA who from the very first week just was, had such a strong sense about her that she was going to law school and that eventually one day she hoped to be on the Supreme Court. And I remember the other students were like, come on, that's like too high, that's too much. But she's dead set and I believe her. Um, so she very much already at age 18 had a certain goal and that was definitely a part of her identity and informing the choices that she was making. Okay, so lots of factors. It's complicated. It's further complicated because we change, right? So one of the things that I want you to be keeping in mind, I'm gonna highlight later, is the fact that uh, 
we change as we develop. That's not just about becoming more mature. That's also, I think, just a part of what it means to be a human being. And so, quite naturally, our identity changes. And to the degree that we're trying to grab a hold of it, maybe tell a story about it, we have to take seriously that aspect of change. So that's something to keep in mind. But we need to move on. Let's talk a little bit about narrative. So you, I think, have all by now read uh, this essay called How Shall I Live, uh, written by the Northwestern uh, psychologists um, uh, Dan McAdams and Jennifer Guo. Um, this is a, there's a lot of interesting things going on in these few pages, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. They share this uh, life narrative interview, which I encourage you to, uh, to reflect on in your journal or maybe even do with your roommate or a friend. Really great set of questions in the life interview. Um, and they talk about the importance of struggling to figure out the narrative of your life, especially in these college years. It's sort of the natural time to do that, so it's very sort of affirming of something that you're probably already doing. And then for, um, in sort of the middle part of this essay, they pick up on something that actually you find in a book that uh, I love and I want to recommend to you, a book called Leading Lives That Matter. And this is a book that actually um, NetView, this organization that focuses on vocation, and it's a kind of network of over 200 colleges and universities that Monmouth is a member of. Leading Lives That Matter was an early NetView project. And it was put together by two professors at Valparaiso University, Mark Schwein and Dorothy Bass. Mark Schwein actually was on campus uh, several years ago. I can't remember if he was a Sam Thompson lecturer or if we had him here in some other vein. So there's a mammoth connection here. It's a great book, and one of the things they do in their introduction is highlight these three vocabularies uh, that it's, it's sort of their way of organizing the material to say, look, here's some readings that seem to use language of authenticity. Here's some readings that um, kind of traffic in or are drawing on a little bit more old fashioned way of understanding things, and that's in terms of virtue. And then here's some readings, another vocabulary, another kind of orientation is on vocation. Now, in the Leading Lives That Matter book, it's pretty clear that they have a preference for the vocation language, that they are sort of, if you read that book carefully, <laughs> that, that they're trying to sort of nudge you towards seeing that there's some wisdom, but some limits to authenticity language. And I think that's right, and I'm gonna hint at some of that today. That there's some power uh, in virtue language, but it maybe is insufficient, it's not enough. Now, for them, and I think this is a little bit of this in the McAdams and Guo piece, this return to the language of virtue is actually part of a sort of a movement that we've seen in philosophy and religion that's most identified with a Notre Dame philosopher named Alistair McIntyre. And some would say it's kind of a conservative move, that, you know, that it has this tone of, oh, our culture is going to hell in a handbasket, and we need to return and go back to this time of great virtues. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be read that way, but I just want you to be aware that that's in the background of some of these readings. And then vocation language, which the way they handle it is a much more religious language. So let's just take a little bit of a closer look at, at these. Authenticity, the language of authenticity. This is the one that you probably already know and use and lean on and live, like you swim in it. Even if you don't know the word authenticity, this is very modern, it's very American, um, and it's very powerful. There's good reasons why we started using this language. But the language of authenticity, like all of these languages, has a history to it, and it's worth stopping and paying attention to that history. So here's a couple of examples. The idea, I must be true to myself. I gotta be me. Uh, I don't know if people still say this, but this idea like, you do you. That's total authenticity sort of language and thinking. Um, this quote is from uh, Steve Jobs, follow your heart and your intuition. So notice that saying, how do you figure out what's important? Well, you turn inward, you already have it, nobody can tell you what it is, 
That's how you lead a powerful life. So just some quick examples. This authenticity language, and uh, the essay that you read mentions this, really can be found in this guy, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Did anybody have to read Emerson in high school? Does that still happen? Um, you'd remember if you did, because he has a very distinctive writing style. Uh, pretty old-fashioned, but if you take the time uh, with it, really some powerful stuff, great quotable things. So here's a couple of uh, famous quotes from his essay, Self-Reliance which is probably the most directly about authenticity, but actually this way of thinking is all over uh, Emerson's writings, and it, they're all worth your time. So this idea, imitation is suicide. Think about what that's saying. If you follow kind of the example of someone else, you might as well be dead, right? You might as well just undoes who you are. It's a pretty strong sentiment. But especially in American culture, we really believe this, that everybody should be their own unique self. And there's also a vision of authority here. Nobody can tell you who you are and what you should do with your life. That's powerful, and that was to correct centuries of the alternative view, which would be, no, you have to pay attention to religious authorities or political authorities or sort of family. You can't mess with tradition. My, the image I always have of Emerson, he's like, throw off that dusty overcoat of tradition, right? And just like leap into the future. Not as wild as uh, Walt Whitman, but almost. Another famous line from Self-Reliance, and you get a sense of the old-fashionedness of the language here, whoso would be a man, and for Emerson he means women here too, I think, maybe, asterisk, we can talk about that. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist, right? You have to follow your own uh, beat of your own drum. Nothing, this is quite a claim, nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. That's heady stuff. That's cool. This is, I think, sort of how we think. Here's a more recent articulation, but kind of the same worldview, the same language. This is from the late Steve Jobs, one of the co-founders of Apple Computer. Uh, some places, it's one of these things I found on the internet, and so this is don't do this, I actually don't know exactly where this is in Steve Jobs, but I'm pretty sure he said this. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Notice the attitude towards other human beings here. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition Everything else is secondary. That is full-on authenticity language. Um, you know, and it's cool. If you, if you recognize yourself in this, if you've heard friends say this, if you sort of said this in your own mind, um, that's cool. That's fine, actually. I, mean, I think part of where I'm going with this is going to build from this idea. So it's not to throw this out. But um, what does it mean to sort of reject the influence of other people, to have this completely sort of also rejectionist attitude towards tradition, to say that the only form of authority in your life can be your own heart and your own mind and your own intuition. So it, it sort of went pretty far and it's something worth paying attention to. Here's some of the markers of the language of authenticity. I've sort of already said these. One, there's a turn inward, and so when you hear people talk about intuition or your own heart, you have to sort of follow what you know inside. It's probably you're in the realm of authenticity language. Very much an emphasis on the individual and individual authority, right? You can only obey, uh, and you must decide for yourself. You obey yourself. Um, also an emphasis on originality, that you have to be yourself but what comes along with this, which is um, uh, not necessarily the same thing, but there starts to be this emphasis also on uniqueness. That's a tall order to feel like you've got to sort of craft a life that is unlike anybody else. But we really sort of do that to ourselves uh, in this culture. So this is some of the markers of the language of authenticity, and I need to speed up. <laughs> language of virtue is, now we're moving backwards. Um, Virtue is a word that you may not have encountered before you took this class. Now you're sort of hitting it in lots of places. So <laughs> you should assault your, ask your professors, like, why, why do we keep talking about virtue? What is it that you're trying to do to us? Um, so here's one definition of virtue, kind of from a philosophical point of view. Basically, we're talking about good characteristics, right? So if you were to ask yourself, 
what kinds of qualities do you look for in a friend? Or I sometimes would ask students in ethics, if you had to be sort of stuck on a deserted island, um, you know, what kinds of qualities would you want in that person? And once you get past the kind of like, okay, somebody who knows how to put up a tent and has good survival skills, sense of humor sense to often, tends to often come up because you're going to be spending a lot of time together. Usually what, where we land is something like this list of characteristics. But notice, built into the definition of virtue, and this goes back to um, how Aristotle and the ancient Greeks understood it, is this idea that it's not just that you're like happen to be courageous one day and then you celebrate that. It's that it becomes a habit, it becomes who you are. It takes practice, it takes role models, it actually takes tradition because you learn it from observing sort of your elders or people in the past. And then it just becomes part of your second nature. So a courageous person doesn't stop and sort of say, I'm a courageous person. What should I do in this case in order to be courageous? They just act and are courageous. Same with someone who's loyal, a loyal friend. Same with someone who's honest. And this is sort of the package of what we mean by integrity, right? They're sort of reliable and they're dependable. They kind of, I like this image of like, they have their own house in order. They sort of know why they do things. These are sort of the positive qualities. Here's some philosophers who use virtue language, and this is a very idiosyncratic list, and if you don't know that word, put it on your list of vocabs. Professor Ba told me to suggest that. You might be able to pick up what I mean when I say this, like, these are my people. <laughs> this is a weird, strange list of the thinkers who use virtue that have been influential on me and that very much play a part in uh, what some of what, what I'm saying today. McAdams and Guo talk about how virtue language goes back to Aristotle. Yes, that's true, but it's not like Western civilization has sort of a, a corner on the market here. There's a whole rich and actually historically dates back much longer tradition in Chinese civilization, going back to Confucius and then many generations of thinkers after him that were also talking in terms of character and virtue in persons and not surprisingly, maybe emphasize slightly different virtues. So whether it's for the Greeks who put a high premium on um, militaristic prowess, and so courage frequently is on their list. For Confucius, who was concerned about um, his civilization falling apart, he is interested in what does it mean to cultivate things like poetry and musical ability? What does it mean to become the kind of person who in every kind of encounter is able to put people at ease. Um, and so for Confucius, a lot of his virtues have to do with what we would almost call etiquette, um, but it's very interpersonal. It's very much based on um, if you're a daughter, then you uh, inhabit certain virtues towards your parents. Uh, for Confucius, that's called filial piety. Um, as a friend, uh, you in in inhabit certain virtues. From the Confucian point of view, it matters who's the older friend and who's the younger friend because age plays a part in this. So there's some other kind of virtue thinking here. As uh, Professor Ott mentioned, I spent a good chunk of my life uh, wrestling with an old, dead, red-headed guy from California named Josiah Royce uh, who I was one of these people that I decided to write on an obscure philosopher. There's advantages to that because a lot of people don't really care what you say because they're like, yeah, whatever. I'm not sure why you're reading that guy. Um, but uh, I just got really, really obsessed and interested in what he had to say uh, about community, about um, tradition, about American culture at his time. He was writing at the end of the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century. And he wrote this book called The Philosophy of Loyalty which he actually first delivered as a set of lectures here in Urbana-Champaign, and he was coming out from Harvard, which is a long trip then. So he's thinking in terms of loyalty, and so a lot of uh, my last few decades of my life has been devoted to that. Gabriel Marcel is a French Catholic existentialist, uh, a little bit more contemporary than Royce, but who was somebody who actually appreciated Royce and picked up on some of what Royce was saying. And that is a little bit unusual, actually, for a European philosopher to draw on um, an American thinker. Another interesting example is, earlier I was talking about Emerson. 
Emerson, uh, many have sort of shown, uh, was actually quite influential on uh, the German atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. So there's these interesting kind of connections uh, uh, across, across the water. Um, Marcel, in part because he's writing as a Christian, takes the concept of loyalty and talks about it as fidelity. And he's interested in what that means between two human beings in the context of a family, in the context of marriage. Um, but also, what does it mean to take that um, orientation towards another uh, and have that be about God? So fidelity language for, um, for Marcel is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is a religious category. Um, where I'm going with this about creative commitment is going to pick up on some of what Marcel says in this very interesting uh, collection of essays that he called Creative Fidelity. Um, but just to uh, give you a sense of other directions this goes, Nell Noddings, uh, another uh, professor who actually was here on campus at Monmouth a few years ago as a Sam Thompson lecturer, uh, probably now retired, just getting up there in age, but she was a, a philosopher of education. Um, she wrote this very important book about the virtue of care. Uh, and she was part of kind of a generation of feminist ethicists who sort of said, wait, time out. <laughs> There's something particular about the virtues that keep getting trotted out on these lists. There's something kind of masculine about them. They seem to be tied to men's experience. What would happen if we started thinking about a good person uh, from the point of view of those who take care of children, which actually can be men or women. And so she built a kind of a whole sort of an ethics in view around the virtue of care. Noddings, like some of these other thinkers, is interested in relationality, also taking seriously the fact in a way that authenticity language doesn't. We live on this planet with other people. We come to know who we are because of our exchanges with other people. We just are connected to other human beings. And so our philosophies and worldviews need to reflect that. So markers of the language of virtue, positive characteristics, but things that are good habits. This tends to be tied up with a larger view of human fulfillment. And here it's worth uh, going back to a kind of a distinction that uh, Aristotle makes between you sort of like happiness, everybody wants to be happy, right? And there's ways to just sort of satisfy your urges and think that day to day, you've got it, you're happy. Um, but Aristotle, and actually, I would say, as somebody who's kind of had to teach uh, different religions, this is a, a point that in different articulations comes up in lots of the different world's traditions. Life is about something deeper than that. And actually, even happiness is about something more complicated than just satisfying your desires. And so they tend to use language of sort of fulfillment or flourishing. What does it mean to be a full human being? That's what uh, the life of virtue is about. And then all of these thinkers um, very much have as a starting point the importance of relationships. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip ahead. Vocation language. Very old. Um, very important in Christian thought. And for many of the uh, professors and people who work in student affairs and people in higher education who are part of NetView, uh, this is something that's gotten lost that needs to be kind of uh, resurrected and uh, revivified. So the term vocation, uh, uh, sometimes we kind of use it interchangeably with the word calling. I'm going to do just a time check here really quick. Um, and uh, it's tied up with the idea of hearing God's voice, and it's uh, connected to a notion important in Christian history um, about that God sort of has a plan for your life, and it's a matter of hearing that call and then heeding that call. There's actually a lot of different understandings, so like the other vocabularies, there's a history to this, and if you're interested in this, I want to recommend a book edited by the late Bill Plaker, that walks you through, okay, there's these really rich call stories in the Bible, and then for a long time in Christian uh, thought, the only people who had a calling were uh, monks and nuns, right? People sort of withdrew, so it was, it was the kind of thing that only applied to a certain subset of people. After the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther helped expand this uh, to sort of say, no, everybody has a calling. The person who bakes bread for the village has a calling. 
The person who fixes your shoes has a calling. A mother has a calling. And this is very much, I would say, sort of the umbrella in which we mostly operate now. A very popular articulation of vocation that uh, when you visit various campuses who work on vocation, and you may run into this quote here at Monmouth, um, is from a Presbyterian minister, Frederick Beekner. And uh, this is one of these things that like, it's become trotted out so much that it also makes some people groan. So some uh, faculty members here who are overly familiar with this may be groaning. I just want to suggest that I think part of why this articulation of calling is so popular is because it captures authenticity, right, that your calling is about what you most need to do, and nobody else can do it. It sort of has that idea. So it's about you and your particularity and your individuality. But it's not just about you. It's also about being attuned to the needs of the world. And the way I read this quote, that's about the problems of the world. And it's a long list. There's plenty of work to do. Don't worry that you're not going to be able to come up with something. And so that calling is about this interesting intersection of your not happiness, notice he uses the word like deep gladness, this kind of profound fulfillment language, and figuring out how you take who you are, your gifts and your talents, and then sort of plug that into a need in the world. Um, so I've been doing this work on vocation, and a lot of it is pretty theological because the concept of vocation does imply that sense that God has called you to do something. But let me just put my cards on the table here. What I'm wrestling with, and uh, it's, it's still rough around the edges, but I want to figure out ways to talk and think about calling that are not theological. And this is for a few reasons, but in large part it's because a lot of my students at Monmouth College don't necessarily believe in God or don't believe in God or are not sure. For many students here, their understanding of their purpose in life is tied up with their religious beliefs, including a belief in God. But for many students, it's not. And so I actually, uh, I feel like if we're going to be addressing and trying to support undergraduates' exploration of meaning and purpose, which is what NetView is about, we need to come up with some new ways of thinking about this. So what I'm trying to do is come up with a language that is not theological, doesn't sort of rely on a belief in God, but that is not anti-theological. It's a language that someone who does believe in God can still resonate with. So this is the corner that I've backed myself into. So, where are we on time? I have to do this very quickly. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to shift from the language of vocation to the language of purpose, partially to make this a little less theological. And I want to just put down some assumptions that I'm making uh, in a larger version of this, and someday I do hope to write this up. I would actually kind of spell these out as arguments, but for today's purposes, I'm just telling you what I'm assuming here. And I'd like you to think about whether or not you agree with me. And I'd be thrilled if you didn't agree with me uh, because I think that's going to help you get clear about some pretty important things. And also, it might be, if we can have this in the Q&A, you can help me think better about this. So here's just flat out some assumptions that I'm making. Number one, we're finite creatures. What do I mean by this? We're gonna die. And this is from the existentialist. There's very few things we know for sure in life one of the things that we can be certain of is that we are not going to live forever. And then to add insult to injury, we don't even know how or when we're going to die. So this is just a basic fact that we have to deal with. This one you'd be hard to argue against, but you know, some people are into kind of like technology and you know, I don't know, other planets. I guess there's ways to think about extending your life infinitely. We're also temporal creatures. That's just a fancy way of saying we live in time. Um, and that is part of what makes this rich and complicated, and we saw this in the narratives, right? Even as you're trying to sort through your identity, um, and even as you're trying to craft your narrative, it's not like there's a pause button, <laughs> right? So you're doing it while you're living. And so there's a place where uh, Kierkegaard, uh, another Christian existentialist says, here's the thing, we understand backwards, 
Like I can now see the importance of this book that I was forced to read in my freshman seminar, Habits of the Heart. We understand that retrospectively, but we have to live forwards and there's just no avoiding that. So we live in time and one of the key things here is that there's also this sense of flux and change that is just inevitable. And here's the thing. It's not like you figure out your identity and maybe you craft a good narrative. You know, you're in David Wright's writing class and you come out of that with this like really beautiful articulation of who you are and your life story and you're done. I hate to report from closer to 50, it's not that simple because life keeps throwing you curveballs. Uh, you change, your life changes, and so then your narrative has to change. It's just the way it is. All right, third. This is maybe a little bit more controversial. I want to just state that existence is a gift. So I don't know where I came from. I don't know where I'm going after I die. I sort of live in this complicated, agnostic, uh, religiously moody space. It's just my life. Um, so if you are standing solidly in a religious tradition, you may sort of feel like, well, yes, it's a gift. It's a gift from God, right? And here's what's going to happen after you die, et cetera, et cetera. In the absence of that, I want to say, even still, I experience being alive as something that's been given to me. I know not from what. Uh, it frequently feels like I don't deserve it. And so then you sort of operate in this bumbling sort of sense of gratitude. But it's come from somewhere, and it's a gift. It's an opportunity. And I'm going to take this into a direction of it's also a task. So I'd like you to think about whether or not you agree with that. Do you think existence is a gift? Um, another way of saying this is to talk about how life is sacred, that that's all ready to use some religious language, and then it starts to get into social and political issues, which are quite important, but I'm trying to temporarily avoid those here. So I'm saying existence is a gift. Here's another controversial assumption I'm making. I'm just going to state that creating a purposeful life is a task. In fact, later I'm going to use the language of obligation. So you have been given this life. You can hang out. You can just sort of maximize your uh, fulfillment, whether that's um, just you know, spending time with friends, playing video games, being inebriated. That's maybe part of human flourishing. But if your whole life becomes about sort of like just being distracted and entertained, this is where I'm going to moralize a little bit. I'm making a normative claim. I've shifted here. Before I was being kind of descriptive, now I'm actually using some ought language. I'm sort of saying how I think you should act. So if you want, you can, this might be a place where you uh, can intersect and be critical. But I think we have a task, and it takes effort, and it takes work to create a purposeful life. But this is one of the assumptions I'm making in this stuff. Fifth. This is because I'm drawing on those thinkers that I mentioned before. Relationship, the fact that we live in the world alongside other people, but more than that, our relationships to other people are central to who we are. To me, and this is just because of philosophers that I've read and I think maybe probably spending a lot of time reading some uh, religious worldviews, there's also an obligation there. And so it's... it's that relationships, the fact of other people, informs our identity, but it also informs our sense, our purpose. And that's where I'm headed with this for uh, creative commitment. So here's my assumptions. Um, and uh, you can have some good discussions if, you're, if your ILA instructor has time tomorrow in class about whether or not you agree with these. So where I'm going with this is something that I am tentatively calling uh, lives of creative commitment. So let me say a little bit about what I mean by that. The notion of commitment is really picking up on language of loyalty, but I'm trying to make it a little bit broader. Um, one of the things that I sort of learned from uh, Royce, and I've now found it in some other thinkers, so uh, he's, he's not just making this up, you can't become a self, notice that I've uh, given it an alf, I've capitalized it there, so philosophers do that. It can be a little bit of a squirrely move. I obviously am trying to make a distinction between small s self. I haven't spelled out what I mean, but it has to do, this goes back to Immanuel Kant, with notions of full personhood, which is more than just becoming an adult. It means you also are uh, 
uh, cognizant of the decisions that you make, able to take responsibility for your choices. There's actually a lot of work, and there's many adults who are not capital S selves or persons in this sense. You can't become a self without first committing to projects that involve other people. So Royce talks about this in The Philosophy of Loyalty, but much more recently, Meg Jay, in a book called The Defining Decade, talks about this specifically in reference to people your age. In that book, and she's got a great TED Talk if you want to uh, Google it and take a look, um, she says, you know, here's the thing. Young adults frequently act like the 20s, that decade, is you can just sort of hang out, and it's not real life, and you can sort of put off and defer the stuff of life, making decisions about who you're going to share your life with, what you're going to do in terms of career or work, maybe whether or not you're going to be part of a religious community, whether or not you want to take on the care of children. And so what she's noticed as a psychologist who works with young adults is um, there's this tendency to want to defer. Now, there's probably some economic reasons there, and um, even the category of young adulthood is relatively new. But I think what Meg Jay's trying to say in, in this book, and it's a, gr it's a great book, uh, is that you don't really become an adult until you start making commitments. You have to do that taking risks because you're not gonna get all of the information beforehand. That's a William James point. Um, but that's how you then become a self. And so the way Roy says this is you can't sort of wait around to try and decide what you're going to be loyal to, what, what projects you're going to align yourself with. You sort of, you know, reflect on it, make decisions, and then that slowly forms who you are. By making commitments and acting upon them, you let something outside of yourself make a claim on you. So there's some radical freedom here in the sense that you get to choose, uh, although there could be some projects that are wicked or pernicious or problematic, and you'd have to build in here how you sort those out. But when you do that, you then are actually signing on to doing some things and not other things, because based on your values and commitments, you've sort of decided, this is important to me and I'm gonna act accordingly. So it can sound like it goes against freedom, but for Royce and some of these other thinkers, there's a place where sort of St. Paul in the New Testament sort of even sort of says this. It actually, taking on the yoke of faith becomes a new kind of freedom is the theological language here. Again, I'm trying to talk about a related idea in a non-theological way. What do I mean by calling this creative commitment? Uh, I'm on a little bit of thin ice here, but I'm, I'm trying to follow Gabriel Marcel. There's kind of two senses. Your life of creative commitment is creative not in the sense that you have to be an artist. I certainly am not, I have no abilities. My sister and mother do, but I have no artistic abilities, no musical abilities. Oberlin, you may know, has this conservatory, so like the campus is crawling with these incredibly, ridiculously talented people, like Professor Ott, who if you ever hear him sing in chapel, it just blows your mind. I don't have any of that, right? So I'm just one of these people who bumbles along and don't have those kinds of skills. I don't mean creative in that sense. I mean creative in the sense that you get to craft your life. You are the maker here. You are the artist of your life and the sense of purpose. So the commitments that you sign on to is the way that you're constructing that, but it's on you. In some ways, this is um, also an agency thing. I think I just smushed these together. So I mean creative in the sense of agency. To a certain but significant degree, you get to craft your life. Um, it's not wide open, there's things that sort of, you know, limit us and we have to acknowledge that. And by making commitments and acting upon them, um, new possibilities emerge, and that's sort of what Marcel does with this. Uh, um, this is how you develop the content of your vocation, your sense of purpose. So again, you might understand this as coming from God as a calling, but I want to shift and sort of think about this as the commitments that you make, and that becomes the, um, the content and the substance. I mentioned that it involves risk, it also involves responsibility, um, so I'll just jump ahead on that so that we can have at least a f minute, two minutes, one minute for questions, things either that weren't clear or things that you vehemently disagree with and you want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. 
that, yeah. So the question is, is that um, the language of authenticity seems to imply that you choose, whereas the vocabularies of virtue and vocation, it seems to come from someplace else, and so that wouldn't align very well. I mean, in a way, that's one of the things that Alistair McIntyre is concerned with, is that we move back and forth between these different vocabularies, and actually, they're very different worldviews, and so that means that we're sort of really standing on, or we're leaning on a pretty incoherent narrative. It doesn't really add up. The only thing I'll say today is that the virtue stuff, I think, is, n is less coming from someplace else, um, although for the... Um, for the ancients, their sense of the content of what it is to be a good person very much comes from tradition. Uh, but one of the things that intrigues me about the work of Nell Noddings is what does it mean to sort of update that and so to sort of make it closer to who we are. It's not necessarily from someplace else, but it is sort of social and cultural, so you're right about that. But good, if you're sort of now thinking, I mean, if you get out of this talk and you're reading of the Make Adams and Guo piece, some good antenna so that when you hear authenticity language, it's like, oh, that's authenticity language. Oh, that's trafficking in virtue. That's great. I actually think that's really, really important. That helps you uh, become aware of some assumptions that uh, people around you are making, and it'll help you get clearer on what you think. So I'm sorry that we didn't have more time for questions. <laughs> so. There we go. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Shell, for being with us today. My only quick announcement is that the videos of the convocations are available to you. Go to the Monmouth College uh, website and just search for convocations. By tomorrow, this video will be up, and we will send you a PDF of it later. Have a fantastic day. <laughs>